Amen. And he said not to spit on him, so I got to be talking this way so I don't spit accidentally. Yes, yes. We're going to prove the Bible's word of God. It says the ringing of the nose bringing forth blood. So come up here. <laughs> Amen. Are we ready? Okay. Yes, sir. I believe so. You guys watch for the green lights. Yes. Yes. All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you tonight? Wow, what a week so far. Amen. Who's had perfect attendance so far? Raise your hand. You've been here for the whole meeting. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Wow, what a blessing. Well, we're going to look at something tonight that you probably already know. But the best way, like I said the other night, to learn is repetition, repetition, repetition. So it never hurts to hear the same thing more than once. Um, but it's also good not only to know it, but to know where it is in the Bible. A lot of people say, well, I believe that's true because pastor told me. And you say, really? Well, show me in the Bible. Uh, well, you'll have to go ask him because I don't know where it is. Yeah. No, you're supposed to know where it is in case you ever come across someone that doesn't know. You're the one that's supposed to be able to show them in the Bible. So m most of this message, like I said, you probably already know. But hopefully this will help you to remember where it is in the Bible so that you can show it to other people. So we're going to look at this subject today, keeping the Old Testament or the New Testament commandments. Very simple. Do we go by the Old Testament or do we go by the New Testament? Are they the same? Uh, a lot of people nowadays say we just follow the whole Bible. You ever heard people say that? Um, a lot of people today, they think we're still under the Ten Commandments. I can't tell you how many Christians I've seen that say, well, I just follow the Ten Commandments. Before I was saved, I was taught, just follow the Ten Commandments and cross your fingers and you might go to heaven if you follow them. Oh, well. You know, that, that's the kind of shallow teaching that I was given right. in many churches that I went to as a child. And that's what is taught in a lot of places in the world today. Just be a good person and keep the Ten Commandments. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, then you'll go to heaven. But that is not the gospel. So I just want to give this message knowing that hopefully it'll be a blessing to somebody here. So you'll just know where these verses are in the Bible. We know somebody might be watching online as well. But I do get many, many, many emails from people. And they're so confused. And many of them still think that we're under the Old Testament. So we're going to start today. We're going to look at this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll start in verse 6. And the Bible tells us what we should be. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul, our apostle, amen, amen, says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So if someone's a preacher, he's supposed to be a minister, right? Amen. And he's not just supposed to be any guy that fills the pulpit. That would be a hireling. He's supposed to be able He's supposed to know something. He's supposed to be able to rightly divide. He's supposed to be an able minister of what? The New Testament. Amen. Now, he should know his Old Testament too, but we're not under the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. So it says here, verse 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, just remember that. The letter killeth. What is that talking about? Under the Old Testament, there were some sins that if you did, it was... <coughs> You dead. Amen. And you were to be stoned to death. Does that sound like grace to you? <laughs> Aren't you glad we're under grace and not have to worry about, oh, today might be the day they stoned me, you know? Wouldn't that be horrible to live like that? But that's what it was like back then. And it says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, now watch what he says, which glory was to be done away. It's talking about the Old Testament and Moses. Well, God gave what? The Old Testament through Moses. God gave the law to Moses. And we're reading here, and it says that law given to Moses was to be done away. Hmm. Did you read that? And so it says it was glorious in its time. It was glorious. I went into a gun shop with Conrad one time. And we walk in, and the whole wall has guns. And you should have seen Conrad. He goes, it's glorious. It's an AK-47 and an AR-15. It's glorious. And I just thought it was so funny how he used that word. Sometimes there's some things in this life that are glorious. The Old Testament law was, past tense, glorious. But Paul says, but it was to be, what? Done away. So it says there, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? 
For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, that's Old Testament, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. He's talking about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He said the Old Testament was glorious in its time, but what we're under now is far more exceeding glorious. What is it we're under now? Grace. Amen. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Okay. And then we continue reading there. For if that which is done away was glorious. I still deal with people that say we're still under the Old Testament law. And you know what I ask them? Do they even read their Bible? People say I say that a lot in my videos. I don't realize that, but I guess I do. They said I need a t-shirt that says, do you even read your Bible? And I think someone made me one up and sent it to me. But, boy, that would be a good t-shirt. What did we just read? Look what it says there. And it says, what verse was that, by the way? Verse 11, right? For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And that has been my prayer. Lord, help me just to speak plainly and give a plain presentation. And I found that the Bible is the best way to speak. If you just read what it says, it says what it means. It means what it says. No need for me to try to explain it away and try to explain what. No, I'll just read it. And then you just believe it. That's the way it should be. So we use great plainness of speech. So the Apostle Paul is saying we need to speak plainly. And that's what we should do. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Did you see that? What is that which is abolished? The law. I can't tell you how many times I got in a little uh, debate with a Seventh-day Adventist or someone like that that believed they were under the law. The law is not abolished. We're still under the Old Testament law. No, it says right here, and it says again in Ephesians 2.15, that it was abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. How many times has he said it's done away? Quite a few. And yet people out there, nope, it's not done away. We're still under the Old Testament. Do they even read their Bible? Which veil is done away in Christ. Remember, was it several nights ago we looked at the seven mysteries and what was one of them? In Christ. Were they in Christ in the Old Testament? Could you get in Christ through the law? No, you couldn't. What a great day to live. Now we can be in Christ through grace. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now I believe that's going to come very soon after the rapture. The two witnesses show up in the book of Revelation, 144,000, and the Jews are going to start to have their eyes opened. And they're going to realize, ooh, wow, boy, did we get it wrong. And that, I'm looking forward to that. Of course, I'll be in heaven, but I'm sure we'll get to see a little bit of that. You think we'll get to see the preaching of the two witnesses in heaven? God will go, come here, guys, come here, Channel 7. Look, here's what's going on on earth. And we'll go, oh, and here comes Moses and Elijah. Wouldn't that be amazing? But it says here, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Thank God for liberty. Amen. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So back to verse 6. What does it say? Who hath made us able ministers. I just want to be an able minister of the New Testament. I just want to preach what it teaches. Amen. I don't want to get people back under bondage to the law. And that's what it is. And that's what religion is. Religion is bondage. People ask me, are you a religious person? I go, no, I'm, I'm a saved person. Because <laughs> I see a difference. Do you know what the difference between religion and salvation is? Religion is a system of works that men do thinking they're justifying themselves before God and they should go to heaven because of their works. And that's not salvation. Salvation is what happens when you give up trusting in your works and you trust in the blood of Christ, Amen. His finished work, and that's when you're saved. Quite a difference. Born again. Amen. So there's a difference. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 real quick. Like I said, you probably already know this, but it's good to know where it is in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. And the Bible talks about there's a difference. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. Paul says this. By the way, let's, let's back up to verse 14. You know, Hebrews 9, 14 is one of the greatest verses in the Bible to help you when you're going through something. You know, a lot of times we do something stupid. No, oh, you've never done that, have you? I've done it once. Well, okay, maybe more than once. But 
Sometimes you do something dumb and, and you just you can't get over it and you keep dwelling on it and dwelling on it. Maybe, maybe it's the devil making you think about how dumb you are. But you know verse 14 there helps me a lot. Look what it says. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from what? From dead works to serve the living God. Don't dwell on something you did. It's under the blood. Leave it there. And now do right. A lot of times, a lot of Christians are in the dumps because they're always thinking about that thing they did. It's under the blood. If God forgot about it, why can't you? Okay? Now, don't do it again, but it's over. It's done. It's dead. Don't bring it back to life. Forget it and move on. Put it behind you. But look what it says in verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance, okay? For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, I think we'll read the rest of that chapter here in a second just because it's so good. But what is that telling us? That's telling us that right here is the focal point of the Bible. And something happened here where something changed. And what is it? Right here starts the New Testament. So before this right here is the Old Testament. And so what, what is it that started it? Something happened, and I don't have a red marker. <laughs> and I thought I had a red marker here, but okay, I'll have to use this one. It's a smaller one, but it'll work. Jesus died shedding his blood. So that started a New Testament by the death of a testator. Okay? So now we're under that, not under this. It's something new. I don't know if you've ever had a computer. But if you have a computer, you have to sometimes get a new, what, Windows? Upgrade, right? So if you're in Windows 10 and you upgrade to Windows 11, can you go back to Windows 10? No, no, you're, you've got to deal with the new one because the old one is the old one. Now you can't have the new one, right? Well, it's an upgrade. What Jesus did was an upgrade. I don't want to go back to the other window. I'll, I'll just go ahead with this one, right? Yeah, bring that up, please. So isn't that a blessing to think about? How can people read the Bible and think we have to go back to that? Doesn't that basically say what Jesus did isn't important? Isn't that kind of just literally saying, Jesus, I, I, I don't accept this and I don't care about that? Wow. How do people try to get people back under the Old Testament? That's almost like they're denying the Lord who died on the cross. Now, just for funsies, let's read verse 17 all the way down to the end of the chapter because there's so much good stuff here. And it says, verse 17, For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Remember the Old Testament? Do you remember? Do you read your Bible? Do you even read your Bible? Do you remember how the New Testament started? God said to Moses, Come here and bring Aaron and bring the priest. And they sacrificed an animal and they put the blood on the right thumb, the right ear, and the right big toe. And that blood was what started the Old Testament. And what was it? It was the blood of animals. And that went from here to here. But then came the blood of Jesus, which is God manifest in the flesh. That started the New Testament. Why would you deny the blood and go back to another blood? That doesn't make much sense. How could we ever go back to the Old Testament? It's not for us. And then it says, um, verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. That's interesting. Sprinkle the book. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So the first testament. We call it the Old Testament. But when it happened, he said, this is the New Testament. Because it was new back then. But it's not new now. Now it's old. Now we're under the new. And uh, it says, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Wow. 
So when he rose again, where did he go? Up there. And I believe he offered his blood up there as the one sacrifice forever. And there was the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <laughs> Amen. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Amen. So we are not under the Old Testament. That's right. If we were under the Old Testament... We couldn't accept Jesus and his blood. We'd have to go find an animal and sacrifice its blood. So do you see there? I don't understand how people want to say, no, no, we're still under the Old Testament. Let's, let's. Old Testament was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Amen. You want to get up here? I mean, just no, I'm getting to that. We're going to get to those verses, but good, good point. We're going to get there. Amen. So, amen. <laughs> if you have questions, though, I'll take questions at the end. I'll be happy to. So think about that. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 13. And uh, we looked at this verse, but I believe when we looked at this uh, in one of the other teachings, it was from a different one of the Gospels. This is also in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 13. Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, the Bible says, and we read these words. So something changed when Jesus showed up. Matthew 11 and verse 13, what does it say? <clears throat> Matthew eleven thirteen 13 says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So that's an interesting thing. The law was where the prophets were during this time, and they prophesied. So there was prophecy under the law. So the law was prophecy, and what was it prophesying of? Something new is about to come. So look for that new thing. So that's an interesting thing. The law is prophecy. Now, John chapter 1 and verse 17, we don't have to read it, but it says, The law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. So you have two different people here. you got Moses... Old Testament, and Jesus bringing in the New Testament. And they're not the same. They are not the same. There's a difference. And to be an able minister of the New Testament, you have to be able to say, hey, that was then, this is now. Okay, that's more than just the title of a book by S.C. E. Hinton. No, that's Bible. That was back then, this is now. Okay, if you're from Oklahoma, you'd get that. If you're not, you probably wouldn't. But anyway, it's a book by someone from Oklahoma that wrote that book. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Horrible book, by the way. But anyway, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Now look at this. Now, why are you preaching this, Brother Breaker? Because I have run into a bunch of them, and you will probably too. And I want you to be able to know how to deal with these people who want to say, no, we're still under the Old Testament. I don't understand how they could say that if they read the New Testament. Maybe they haven't read the New Testament. So let's show them these verses. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Look at 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Where were the prophets? Back here in the Old Testament. And there was a salvation that they were prophesying about. Gee, what could that have been? Well, Paul says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. So they're waiting for the salvation that was going to come from him. So they were the prophets. And look what it says. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So they prophesied of, hey, something new is coming. When it does, you better jump on board with the new because the old is going to be done away. And then it says here, verse 12, unto whom it was revealed... That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things. Wow, isn't that amazing? God told them, write this down in, in this book. And they're reading it, and they don't even understand what they're writing. And it's a prophecy for us. That's what it says right there. They wrote it for us over here. Isn't that amazing to think? Wow. And they're just like, what did I just write? I'm sure when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53, he went back and goes, no idea what that's about. Maybe somebody in the future will figure it out. Well, we figured it out and we shout and we rejoice when we read it. But it says here, But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Isn't that a wild verse? 
I look at it like this. God's up in heaven and he's telling the, the um, prophets to write some stuff down. And the angels are like watching and, and listening. And they're like, Lord, what, what's that about? Just wait. <laughs> You'll find out later. And here they had to wait 2,000, 3,000 years. And I'm sure the angels went, oh, that's what he was talking about. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I don't know why God didn't reveal it to the angels, but I guess they don't need salvation, right? Um, we need salvation because we're the fallen race. So there's a thing called the law and a thing called grace. And today we're under grace. This is the church age. Back then it was the law. The law was for Israel. Is the law for the church? No. no. The law was for a nation of Israel. Today, God is not dealing with a nation as much as he's dealing with an individual for salvation. Amen. So it's a little bit different. Now, the law was for Israel as a nation for a specific purpose, and that's where we're going. Galatians chapter 3. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Amen. Good minds think alike. Amen. That's what they say. So praise the Lord for that. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22. So Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22, the Bible says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ... Right there, faith of Christ. I don't have time to get into that. But seven times in the Bible it talks about the faith of Christ. And then there's other times when it talks about our faith in Christ. Did you know there's faith of Christ and faith in Christ? New versions change that. They take out every time it says faith of Christ. They take out Jesus Christ's faith. What was his faith in? Go to YouTube and look up Robert Breaker. <laughs> faith of Christ versus faith in Christ. And you'll see. Because Jesus' faith is in the thing that our faith is supposed to be in. And you'll learn if you'll see that video. So it says, by faith of J Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Salvation by faith in the church age. Grace. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So under the law, it was not by faith, was it? And a lot of guys, they're like, people say the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. And that doesn't sound like that right there, does it? <laughs> under there, they were under the law, waiting for the time when we're saved by faith. It, hmm, it seems like it's a little bit different. And it says, um, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the law, okay, get this. This is really easy to understand. The law is a schoolmaster. And we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which is the law, so we are no longer under the law. Right? Do you see that? I wish you could see the emails I get from people. We're still under the law, Breaker. How dare you say we're not under the law? Have they even read the Bible? It's very, very clear that we're no longer. And then it says, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So it's faith that saves us. We are not under the law. But people say, no, no, I think we're still under the law. Okay, let's go to Scripture. Let's go to Scripture. If you run across a person like this, do you know what verses to take them to? That's what I'm doing tonight is trying to help you. I hope you're taking notes. And I hope you can take them to these verses because it's very, very, very easy to prove that we're not under the law. So many verses. Majority of them are from Paul. Maybe that's why these people that say we're still under the law never go to Paul. Hmm. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Do you know that two-thirds of the New Testament is Paul? So you leave out two-thirds of the whole New Testament if you leave out Paul? Interesting. Okay, so uh, Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So Paul is saying it's like this. If a woman marries a man, she's bound to that man her whole life until he dies. When he dies, she's free to marry another. Well, we're the woman, and the law was our first husband. Guess what? Jesus came, fulfilled the law. The law's dead. Now we can marry Christ. 
Okay? So that's what it's saying. So keep reading here, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motion of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, you want to have a fun Bible study, look at all the times that Paul says, but now. That shows it wasn't like that back then, but it's like this now. If that's not that difference, I don't know what is. Remember, we want to be an able minister of the what? I didn't write it up here. Of the New Testament. A lot of people out there claim to be pastors that are not very able ministers of the New Testament because they don't even get half of what I'm showing you tonight. I want to make sure I'm an able minister. So he says there, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So what was the law for? To show us what sin is. So all those thou shalt nots, that's the mind of God. This is what I don't want you to do, because I want you to please me. And so the Old Testament law was don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and then do this, do this, do this. And the people under the Old Testament, they had to do that. But do you see the difference between the law and grace? Under law, it's you have to or else. Under grace, it's I want to because I know what he did for me. A want to is much better than I have to. Because when you have to do stuff, are you always cheerful and happy when you have to do it? You get up and the yard's like that high and you got to go mow it. Do you go, praise God, honey, I'm going to go mow the yard. I'm so happy. Or do you go, oh man, the neighbor's going to yell at me if I don't go do it. Right? You have to do something. You're not always happy. But when you want to do something, then you can have joy. There's a lot more joy under grace than there was under the law. So let's look at some more verses. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. How anyone could say we're still under the law shows they haven't read the Bible because we are no longer under the law. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, people say, well, if I'm under grace and not under the law, then I can go do whatever I want. <laughs> grace is not an excuse to sin. Amen. All right? I heard a preacher say this one time. I don't know if I should say it, but I'll say it. Just remember it was him. I'm quoting him. I'll put quotations. He said, I'm under grace, and because I'm under grace, I can do whatever the hell I want, he said. And I went, Cussing's included, huh? You want to use that word as a cuss word. That's what he thought. I'm under grace and I can do whatever the blank I want. That's somebody that doesn't love Jesus. Because when you get a hold of that right there, I want to serve him. And I can't wait to do what he wants and put my flesh down. I don't look at, oh, grace as an occasion to the flesh and go, wow, so now I can go do this, this, and this, and this. That's not how I look at it. And I don't think that that's how the Lord wants us to look at it. Grace is not an occasion to the flesh. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. So I just want to give you these verses. And I want you to realize that when you come to Jesus and you see yourself as a sinner and he saves you, it should make you want to serve him. We're not forced to, but because he did that for me, now I want to. You see that, that thing? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The law is a curse. If you're under the law, you're cursed. Why would anyone say, No, we're still under the Old Testament and try to get you back under there? They want you to be cursed? Weird. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ, now look at this verse, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So he got rid of that curse by taking our penalty, our sins, and paying for them. And so now the curse is removed in Christ. Why would you go back to the curse? Why would you go back to Windows 98 when they have the new over here? Why would you want the old? 
Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right, now, you can tell me if I'm wrong if you want. And I've had pastors tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. But we're saved by faith, Amen. not the works. Because guess what? It was all about works under the law. It's not the works that saves us. It's the faith that saves us today. You see the difference? Do you see how the law was all about works? It's all about do, 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 do. And you're cursed if you didn't do it. So it's not the works of the law that save us. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. And I thank God for that because if it was by works, oh boy. <laughs> do you know what the first thing is you'd have to do if you wanted to be under the law? No, no, no. What's the very first thing you have to do to follow the law? I'll, I'll make it more simple if you're a man. Circumcision. You know what circumcision is? I don't want to be graphic and I don't want to explain it. Let's just say you take some scissors and you pull your pants down and you cut off part of your manhood. Okay? You want to be under the law, do you? When I meet a Seventh-day Adventist and he says he's under the law, I say, Sir, do you mind pulling your pants down for me right now? <coughs> what do you mean? You know, I say, Sir, you know that's what the Jews did. Okay, I'm not making something up. Did you know that when the Old Testament, when they went to the Jewish synagogue, they had to lift their skirt before they walked in? Because if they saw a man that was a Gentile, they wouldn't let him in. Did you know that? That's weird. That's, that's, thank God we don't do that today. Amen. But a lot of these Seventh-day Adventists, we're under the law. We're under the law. Well, have you ever been circumcised? No. You hypocrite. Right? Jesus comes and he deals with a bunch of hypocrites. That sounds like the most hypocritical thing in the world. We're under the law. Okay, the first thing you need to do is snip, snip. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Then you're not under the law. You're the biggest hypocrite that ever yeah, lived. That's right. That's right. Just saying. I mean, <laughs> my wife doesn't like it when I say I'm just saying. But maybe I should say the Bible's just saying. The Bible's just saying. Okay, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14. Look what it says. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. <laughs> Praise God for that. That means past, present, and future. Do you know under the law you only had them forgiven up to that point? If you went out and sinned right after, now you need another sacrifice. And then after you do that sacrifice, the next time you sin, you need another one. Jesus' sacrifice is all that I did yesterday, all the sins I'm going to do today, and all the ones I'm doing in the future. They're all forgiven through one sacrifice. Whew. Now some people look at that erroneously and think, and that's why I'm going to go do another sin. You shouldn't think that way. You should think, thank God they are forgiven. That makes me want to not sin. Okay? But look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Where is the law? It's nailed to the cross. Amen. It's taken out of the way. Amen. How can a person say we're still under the law if it's done away and taken away? I don't, I don't understand. But I still, up until this point, I have talked to many, many people. And you know what they tell me? Well, no, 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 we're still under the law. How they can deny that much scripture, I don't know. It's like my dad used to say, that's enough scripture to sink a battleship. I mean, that's enough proof to sink a battleship. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. This is my go-to verse. This is my favorite verse to go to. Because they say, we're still under the law. We're still under the law. We're still under the law. <laughs> the law hasn't ended. This is how they talk. The, the law isn't over. We, the, God didn't abolish the law yet. No, we're still under the law. Okay. <coughs> Romans 10.4. You know what 10.4 is? You ever use a radio? When I was a kid, they made fun of me. Breaker, breaker, one nine for a radio check. Come back, you know, because my name's Breaker. 10-4, big buddy. That's what you say when, you, when you're, you, you, you agree something. When you say amen, it's 10-4. Romans 10-4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. How do you argue against that? You can't. But yet they do. So we are not under the law. We are under grace. So it's not the law that saves us. It's not doing the works. Why would they hold on to the Old Testament? Because they want to do the works and brag about themselves. That's why a lot of people want to be under the law, because they want to do good and say, look at how great I am. And they want to get to heaven based upon their works. They don't see themselves as God does. They're cursed. So people that are lost are usually self-righteous, aren't they? They usually say, look at me, I do this and I do that and I do this. Are they going to heaven? 
because they did something? Did anyone in the Old Testament go to heaven by keeping the law? You cannot show me one. Because, let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Because the law can't save you. The law can't save a dead horse. The law is not what saves you. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, where did they go if they followed the law? If they did follow the law, they ended up going to not heaven, but to Abraham's bosom. (laughs) That's way different. Today we get saved through faith alone, and when we die, we go directly to heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Is that what took place back here? No. If they followed the law, and by the way, even if they did everything the law said, they, they still didn't have forgiveness until there was the blood sacrifice made for them. So that was part of the law. And that is a work. I could only imagine it took a lot of work to get a sheep to follow them. And the sheep wants to go that way, and they're like, come this way. They were probably sweating by the time they got that thing there because they walked a long ways. And then they had to cut its throat. and they had to... That seems like a little bit of work involved to do a, a, an atonement like that. So I think the Old Testament was works. That's what I see. But I don't see anyone saved by it. I see them as safe. Because then they would have gone to Abraham's bosom based upon that blood of atonement. And so they were safe down here. But were they saved? Jesus is called the author of eternal salvation. If he's the author, he's the one that wrote it. So really there wasn't any salvation in the Old Testament until he died and rose again. And he took them up with him. Wow, I can just hear it today. Southern Baptists. They're going to start saying, Robert Breaker's a heretic. Oh, he says no one was saved in the Old Testament. You ever hear him? People are saved the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Was anyone even saved in the Old Testament? They went to Abraham's bosom if they obeyed the law. So they were safe, I guess. But the salvation was through Christ who took them out of Abraham's bosom. He's the author of eternal salvation. I, I see that as I read it and I just say, wow, that's amazing. So Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Here we have Christ's faith again, the faith of Jesus. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So no one has ever made it to heaven through keeping the law. So why would you try to get back under it? I mean, that's a very plain, simple statement. Salvation is through faith. Faith in what? Well... First of all, where are the verses on faith? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the Bible tells us over and over again we're saved by faith. Faith in what? Romans chapter 3, please. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. When I saw this, man, I was like, praise the Lord. I saw this probably four or five years ago as I was reading through this and doing a sermon similar to this one. And I was like, that's not our law. We have a completely different law today. Do you know what our law is today? I hope you get excited because I am. I'm about to pop, man. I'm excited. You know what our law is? Read this with me. Okay, first of all, Romans 3.25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So faith, what should our faith be in? The blood. Okay? But let's read this in context. Because when we get down toward the end of this verse, it tells us what our law is today. So let's start in verse... Um, well, let's start with verse 21. <laughs> with the but now. Amen? Amen? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested... Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Why? Because they were prophesying of it's going to be different someday when somebody comes and makes something new. And it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It's faith that saves us, not what we do. It's when we trust. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Then verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. When you trust the blood of Jesus, do you know what you're doing? You're saying, He is the righteous one and I'm the unrighteous one. Because I can't save myself, I come to Him to save me. And I trust what He did to save me because... If I did everything that said, I still couldn't be saved. Do you get that? Now, verse 27, where is boasting then? There's a lot of boasters out there, aren't there? 
Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the what? Law of faith. Law of faith. What is our law today? It's not the Old Testament. It's faith. Faith is our law. The law of God today is you must come to Him through faith to be saved. Right. Hebrews 11 says, without faith it's impossible to please Him. Right. You want to please God, then trust His blood. That's what the Bible teaches. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. How anyone could say, but we're still under the Old Testament law. That's just silly. That's just, that's like saying the moon is made out of cheese. That's the most outlandish statement that it's just like, no. How could you, what? So you could read through there, the last couple of verses there too, but what is the, the law of, of for us today? Not the law of Moses, the law of faith. Whew. Boy, what a blessing it is to be saved by faith. Look at Acts chapter 26. Now I'm going to keep going, okay? I could stop right there, but, but I might as well keep going, amen. Acts chapter 26. Um, we have Paul telling us about when he got saved. And when he got saved, the Lord told him, this is what you're going to go do. Verse 16, 26, 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. I think Paul's an able minister, don't you? Yeah. Well, I want to be one too, so I'm going to follow Paul. And I'm not going to get back under the law because he said not to. He said, An able minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. What was Paul sent for? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So we're saved by faith in Jesus and what He did. It's what Jesus did that saves us. So are we still under the Old Testament law and its commandments? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see how. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't understand how someone could say that. That shows a complete lack of understanding of the New Testament. Why on earth would you try to get back under the Old Testament law? It's like you're doing this. You're looking at Jesus on the cross and you're going, right. I'm going to go do this over here. And so then God in heaven looks down at you and goes, look at that cursed guy. Well, on you. And you think you're going to heaven after that? You're spitting in his face. I didn't spit on you, did I? Okay, okay, I tried to, okay. Uh, he said, I'm going to sit in the front, just don't spit on me. So I got close though. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So the Old Testament law was a whole bunch of commandments, wasn't it? All right. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Are there any commandments over here? Yeah. Paul gave us some commandments. Jesus gave him some revelations and some teachings that he was to teach us. So we do have some commandments in the New Testament. Did you know that? We don't do them to get saved because we're already saved when we believe. But we do them because we are saved. What could some of those be? Well, let's look at the Old Testament Amen. Ten Commandments. A lot of people, and I've even heard independent Baptists say, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. Wow. That's the law. Why would they say that? Mm. Have they ever read the Ten Commandments? Have you ever looked at all ten of them? Because there's one of them here, there is no way we could keep today. If we tried to, we would all be in jail. Did you know that? We would literally have an instant prison ministry if we tried to follow the Ten Commandments for today because one of them would put us directly into jail. Which one? I'll get to it. I'll get to it. But let me just read them. The Ten Commandments are no other gods before me. Don't make graven images or idols and bow down to them. Don't take the name of God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day or keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness or don't tell a lie. And don't covet things that belong to others. All right. Those are the Ten Commandments. They, they are really great, aren't they? The majority of them are moral. Okay. The majority of them are how we should just be morally. And basically our conscience pricks us, or it should. Amen. So the majority of the Ten Commandments are moral law. But there's one of them, just that one. Yeah. 
that is not moral. It's ceremonial. And that one brings with it something that if you did, you'd go to jail. Turn with me back to Exodus chapter 31. What I'm trying to do here is rightly divide the word of truth. All right. I'm not against the Ten Commandments. I think they're wonderful. I think it's good to be a moral person. But I don't keep these to get to heaven. And I don't go tell people to keep these because I don't want them to get back into the Old Testament. What I do is to tell them to follow the New Testament. And when they do, they follow the majority of these. Except for that one. That one little thing there. That's the stickler. What is that one? Well, I'll just tell you what it is. It's this one right here. Remember the Sabbath day. Yep. Now, what does that mean to remember the Sabbath day? Well, a lot of people think it just means, well, just stay home one day a week. Do you know there's 613 commands in the Old Testament that are part of the Old Testament law? The law is the law of Moses. Some people think the law is just the Ten Commandments. No, those are the main ones written in stone, but then there are subordinances. Have you ever gone to the law books in the courthouse and there's the law, but then it says subsection, subsection. So there's all these little, what are they, statutes underneath there they're called? So under the law, there are some statutes. So when you look at law number four, there's a statute that says death penalty if you don't keep that law. Does that sound like grace? Go kill people that don't do that one? Let's read Exodus chapter 31 and turn over there to verse 12. Exodus 31, 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. All right? This was given to Israel. Are we Israel? So that was then. That was so then. All right? We're not there. But look what he says. Ye shall keep the Sabbath. I'm in verse 14. Therefore, for it is holy unto you, everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Whew. Look at that. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the day of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now, some churches in America try to say we're still under the Old Testament. If we were under the Old Testament law, I would have to follow you on Saturday. And if you do what I do on Saturdays and you go garage sailing, I'd have to, I'd have to grab a stone and stone you to death. Because you can't go to garage sales on Saturdays. That's against the law. Who thinks that we're still under the Old Testament law? Who would think that? Who would think that would be okay to do that? It's not okay. Obviously, we're not back under there. Okay, how about the other ones though? Well, let me go ahead and finish reading there. It says, um, verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and who? The church. Is that what it says? And the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Ten Commandments. So that commandment carries the death penalty if you don't keep it. If you're trying to tell me we're under the Old Testament, then you're telling me I need to go kill people that go do something on Saturday? That's nuts. That's not grace. That was for Israel. God says New Testament, whole new set of rules for the church. But guess what? In the New Testament, we see all of these except that one. So we see not. So I follow these, but I do it because Paul said to, not because Moses said to. Did you know that? So let's look at those real quickly. And let me show you what Paul says and I'll be done. Okay, you can stick a fork in me and I'll be done. But let's go to Romans chapter 13. And in Romans chapter 13, look at this. All of the Ten Commandments are given to Paul in the New Testament except for that one. The Sabbath isn't there. I wonder why. I guess because Jesus didn't want us Christians running around crucifying each other? I think we do that enough already, don't we? <laughs> I don't think he wants us running around killing each other. Hmm. Romans chapter 13, look at verse 8 through 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Wow. Thank God I don't have to read the whole Old Testament and do everything it says. Now I should read it. It was given for admonition, the Bible says, so we should read it. But thank God I don't have to do everything it said. 
like snip, snip. You know, thank God. Uh, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, was that up here? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Where? Oh, well, yeah, okay, so Paul mentions that one. Thou shalt not kill. Okay, well, all right, don't kill. Thou shalt not what? Steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. So steal, false witness, covet. So here's five of them. Did Paul mention the other four? Paul nowhere tells us to remember the Sabbath day. Nowhere in the Bible. In fact, Paul tells us Sunday. But yet there's a certain church out there, calls itself a church. I don't know why they claim to be under the law. They should call themselves a synagogue. But this so-called church out there meets on Saturday. And guess what they say? What did they say? Okay, I'll get to it. it just, it's so ridiculous. It just makes me want to... I don't know, either puke or laugh my head off. I don't know. But they want you to get under the Old Testament law, and they don't read Paul. What does it say here? It says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, what do they say? You ready for this? Who am I talking about? Seventh-day Adventist. They say, if you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. <laughs> what? We looked at the mark of the beast this week, and it's in your right hand or your forehead. How is going to church on Sunday something in your right hand or your forehead? That's weird. So, wow. Now, we'll get to that. I'm going to show you in the Bible where it says go to church on Sunday. And we see the early apostles doing that. Because under the church, it's Sunday worship. Under the Old Testament, it's Saturday worship. And they are completely wrong to say what they say. But anyway, let's go quickly and look at the other things Paul says. Acts chapter 17. Well, I just for sake of time, let me just give you the references. Acts chapter 17. We see Paul preaching. And Paul is preaching in Athens. And when he preaches, he preaches, there's only one true God. You don't need the other gods. There's only one true God. So there's Paul, and there he is right there telling us that one. Okay? Now, for sake of time, I won't read it, but in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, he talks about how they turned from idols. And in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 through 18, he tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost and that we don't serve idols. Well, there you go. We don't bow down to them. So Paul is telling us basically all of these so I follow them because Paul said, not because Moses said, because Paul is our apostle today. Remember Romans eleven thirteen. What else did Paul say in Romans chapter 1? You should read Romans chapter 1 sometime, verse 18 to 25. It talks about how they knew God, but they worshiped Him as not. And they made other gods and a four-footed beast and things like this. And so they, they basically took the name of the Lord in vain because they wouldn't worship the one true God and they called their other gods gods. So they're taking the name of the true God and they're, they're taking, it's, it's vain to them. It's like, no, this is not important. Then in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, honor thy father and mother. So Paul, our apostle today in the New Testament, gave every one for us except that one right there. That one is clearly not for us today. Otherwise, we have to Go kill each other <laughs> if we leave the house on Saturday. Um, those people claim to be Old Testament believers, the Seventh-day Adventists. They don't even practice what it says. They haven't even circumcised themselves. You know what it says in the Old Testament law? Don't even start a fire on the Sabbath day. Yet they all go outside, open the car door, get in, turn the key, and what does that do? It's called a combustible engine which is a fire, <laughs> they start. That, to me, that's like the most hypocritical thing in the world. Right. And I'm not putting them down. I'm not attacking. It just, it tears my heart. How, how do they not think? How do they not read the verses that we read? How do they not see what the Bible says? And then they are very, and I mean very angry with this going to church on Sunday. And they say, you cannot go to church on Sunday. It's the mark of the beast. Amen. And they say... That some pope, about 300 years after Jesus, said, hey, we're just going to start meeting on Sundays from now on. 
like that's the first time anyone ever met on a Sunday. Do you know that's not what happened? Let me show you some verses. Go to Mark chapter 16. I'm almost done, but I want you to know where to show the verses. Amen. Maybe just maybe this week you'll run across one of these people. I hope you took notes so you can sit them down at your table and show them. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. When did Jesus rise again? On Saturday or on Sunday? He rose the first day of the week. All right, when do we see Jesus again? Exactly seven days later he shows up. And that's in John chapter 20. Guess which day Jesus shows up? John chapter 20 and verse 19. Did he show up on Saturday? Did he show up on Saturday and say, now, make sure you go to church on Saturday. Or did he say, did make sure you go to the synagogue on Saturday. No, look what happens. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, what day would that be? That would be a Sunday, being the first day of the week. Tells us right there in the King James Bible. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear, they were assembled on a Sunday. <laughs> what happened? For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. So Jesus instituted Sunday worship by showing up on Sunday. By raising from the dead on Sunday, He appeared to them on Sunday. And through the rest of the Bible, they're meeting on guess which day? Sunday. Now, some of them would go on Saturday to the synagogue to try to win the Jews, but they would always meet on a Sunday. Let me show you that, Acts chapter 20. So I can't believe, and this is one of the things you see on YouTube, there are so many Seventh-day Adventists on YouTube. I get so many emails from people, Brother Breaker, they say it's Mark of the Beast to go to church on Sunday. Uh, are they right? And I have to write back emails. I was like, man, I'm just going to do a video so I don't have to do so many emails. <laughs> you know, watch this video. That's what I'll write back from now on. But Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread... This is about 58 A.D. This is not 300 years later. This is 58 A.D. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. They had a meeting on Sunday, and somebody preached. <gasps> Mark of the beast! Or not. <laughs> Maybe it's just biblical. Maybe it's just biblical. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 2. Um, it's just sad to me how many people will, will willingly follow a cult and be deceived. Isn't that sad? When all they need is just to read the Bible. The answer to every cult is the Scripture. And then there wouldn't be any more cults. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week. Now look what he says in verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, so taking up an offering. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So when were they meeting? Sunday. When were they taking an offering? Sunday. Sunday worship. Sunday worship. Not Saturday worship. Were they going around stoning each other because they didn't come to church on Saturday? Something must have changed. There you go. Maybe it was from the Old Testament to the New. And maybe God had grace. And maybe God's the one that says, this is the way we're going to do it now. Yeah. And going to church on Sunday is the right way to do it. A lot of them, they'll judge you and they'll say you're a heretic or you're this or you're that or you're not right with God because you go to church on Sunday. Have you ever heard that? And you know what they do? They judge you. Don't they? Go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. What does the Bible say? Do they even read the Bible? <laughs> what does the Bible say? Colossians 2, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You have no right to judge what day I go to church. It's none of your business. Because in the New Testament, we choose what day we go. What's today? Wednesday? Well, we've been going on Monday and Tuesday and Sunday. We're going to go tomorrow on, on uh, Thursday. Is this the mark of the beast? <laughs> That's ridiculous. I don't see anything on your foreheads. Do you see anything on mine? Please, do you? I mean, tell me because I, I don't want. Do you see anything in your right hand? So somebody's got some false doctrine. Somebody's a little messed up. And what do they need to be? 
They need to be Bible readers so they can be Bible believers and be able ministers of the New Testament. Because we are no longer under the old. I'll just go ahead and close with the two verses I, I wrote in my notes. Close with. So let's go there. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1. I have no idea what they say, but I say close with them, so let's do it. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. God gave them to me in my Bible studies, so I guess I'll give them to you. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. Sometimes you write in your notes and you forget what you're... That's why I always write the verse and then a little bit after it, so I'll remind me what that verse meant to say. But here I just wrote the verse. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. Here's Paul speaking in Galatians 1.13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. He was in the old persecuting us in the new. And what does he tell us? He says he was wrong. And then he got saved out of that. So when he was in that, he was wrong attacking us, wasn't he? And it says, And profited in the Jews' religion above mine equals in, in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. God said, Paul, I want you to get saved. I want you to get in the right testament with the right doctrine and the right teaching. Thank God He got saved. Now, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So I want them to be saved. Can somebody be saved and trying to get in under the Old Testament? No, many of them are trusting in their works. Are you saved by trusting in your works? No, you're saved by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. So 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. So we're following the epistles of the New Testament. We're not under the old. Amen. Right? And then he says, um, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. See, the law is not grace. We're under grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. When we're saved, we do good works. We're not trusting in those to get us to heaven because we're saved through Christ. Amen. Now we serve Him. Amen. So I wanted to tell you that we follow Jesus, not Moses. We follow the New Testament, not the Old. We follow what God revealed to Paul, not men's traditions. We rightly divide the Bible and follow the Bible rightly divided, not a cult who doesn't rightly divide. And I hope you're saved here tonight. I hope you too understand. You could be someone that says, well, no, no, I'm not following the Old Testament. I don't believe in that. But yet you still think it's through your works that you get to heaven. There's a lot of people out there like that. There's a lot of people out, out everywhere that think, well, you know, it's great that Jesus did that, but I've got to do this too. If you add one drop of your own self-righteousness to salvation, that's enough to where you're not saved. You can't trust in Christ and His blood and one little thing that you do. You have to come to Christ and give up all your righteousness and trust His alone. So I don't know. I don't see your heart. I don't know what you're trusting in to get you to heaven, but I do want you to be saved. So give up trusting in yourself and trust in Him alone. Because if you think it's Jesus and somebody else or something else, or you think it's Jesus and if I do this too, like some people think, yeah, I'll trust Jesus and be baptized. No, it's not water baptism to say. If you add to it, what are you doing? You're saying, I'm the co-savior. It's not enough what He did. I got to do this too. So you're on the cross now? You're up there with them, are you? You know what you're literally saying? You're literally saying, I'm just as good as Jesus. Yes. Wait a minute. He never sinned. And you have. And you think he'll accept you? No, you have to realize, because I sinned, I'm not even close. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. You have to come to him as a sinner. And you have to trust what he did to save you, not your works. Amen? So, Brother Hoffman, would you come? I appreciate you listening. I hope this has been a blessing. Amen.